You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. Hello friends and welcome to another episode of Way Back Wednesday. I'm your host Randy Adcott. It's good of you to join us tonight. So glad to have you with us. Um, we're going to get into some pictures here in just a few minutes, but before we do, I want to share a couple things with you and, and uh, share a couple of announcements and turn the volume down on my phone. I do apologize. <laughs> Um, you know, each week we talk about uh, old pictures and old Rocky Mount and old old memories, and um, I've often requested, uh, or, or at least put the word out that if you had any old information that you wanted to share with other viewers, uh, get them to me, and I'd be glad to share them on the show. And after last week's show, I got a call from Mr. William Rackley, and he said his aunt had some old newspapers that she would like to uh, get in my possession and take a look at and see if there's anything of interest there to me. And so he brought them by my office earlier this week, and um, we got to looking at them, and it, and it was really interesting. I wanted to just share a little bit of this with you. Um, it wasn't in a format I could easily get into a, a digital format, and so I'm just going to hold these up. But this first one is actually, uh, if you remember a few, I don't know, it's been about a month or two ago now, we did a, a segment one night on old grist mills in Rocky Mountain in, in eastern North Carolina, in fact. And we covered several grist mills and we talked about the history of grist mills and the importance of grist mills in this area. And one of the ones we talked about was the Bellamy grist mill. And in 1982, the, in the Sunday Telegram, there was a, a featured article on the Bellamy grist mill. And it was, um, I, I was out of the country when this was released. I was actually in the Navy and gone then. Well, you know what? No, I wasn't. I hadn't left. I hadn't shipped out yet. This was in 82 of July, and I shipped out, I think, in December of 82, so I was still around here. But anyway, I just want to kind of, I'm going to hold this up and show you. This was the Sunday Telegram paper. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, and it, again, it was July the 18th of 1982, and it did a whole page. In fact, I think it carries on over to the inside, too. But uh, it's, it's just a neat article about the Bellamy Mill and the history of the mill. Uh, some pictures, of course, they're all black and white. This was before the telegram could do color pictures. But uh, it's just got a lot of neat information here about the mill. And I was thumbing through this thing, and I, I got a kick out of reading some of the ads. Um, big Star Grocery Store has got uh, whole fryers on sale that week for 49 cents a pound. Uh, sausage, old Virginia sliced bacon was $1.18 a pound. We just went grocery shopping this weekend. And I was shocked to see bacon at four dollars and something, five dollars and something, even six dollars and something a pound. Uh, we ended up buying some turkey bacon because it was a little bit cheaper than the pork bacon. Probably better for you too, obviously. But uh, yeah, grapes ninety-nine cent a pound. Chuck pot roast a dollar ninety-eight a pound. So thirty years ago, you could still buy quite a bit with, uh, with a little bit of money at the grocery store. Lord, those days are gone. Um, and this being a Sunday paper has quite a bit of ads in it. Um, and like I said, I just kind of threw them through and it kind of brought a smile to my face to reminisce about some of these businesses that, that I remember. Some of them are no longer here now, have gone out of business. Uh, one was Ben J. Layton Mobile Home Sales. He's got a nice ad in here. Um, manufactured homes, modular homes. But um, anyway, I just thought it was neat to, to take a look at this paper from, well, from 35, 40 years ago now almost. And, and then there was another, and some of you may remember this, I remember when the Telegram did this, and I don't remember when the last time they did this, but periodically over the years, the Rocky Mount Telegram has come out with special editions that were essentially a collection of prior newspaper prints uh, of the Telegram. And this one actually came out in, oh gee, let's see if I can tell you when this came out. I'm not sure if it's even on here. Oh, here we go. This one was um, August the 31st of 1988. But, and I'll hold this up to show you, this was Congress Declares War. This was a reprint of the 1941 uh, edition where uh, after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, we declare war on Japan. And so this is the whole front page arc of the Telegram as it appeared on, let's see, this is dated December the 8th, the day after Pearl Harbor. December 8, 1941, 
and the whole front page of the telegram, and I have seen this. My grandfather, and I don't know what happened to it after he passed away, but my grandfather actually had this, uh, the original 1941 copy of this when it happened. But anyway, um, thumbing through here, there is actually, there's a, a page here from the Rocky Mount Saturday afternoon uh, telegram from March 30th of 1929. And it talks about the Rick's Hotel being swept by flames. Guests escape safely. Um, there's, I mean, there's, I won't try to read all these headlines, but there's a lot of them here that uh, things we've covered on the show. Uh, talks about some of the hotels that were in business besides the Rick's Hotel. Um, Hertzberg Furs, Daltridge Oil Company. And again, this is from 1929. And then if we turn the page, this one here is actually from, well, this is from March the 4th of 29, and this is when Hoover takes office as President of the United States in 1929, Herbert Hoover. So, like I said, I remember the telegram doing these things. Um, here's the one from April the 13th of 1945. Um, it says, Nation Mourns FDR. Uh, but anyway, like I said, I don't remember when they stopped doing this, and they may still do it. I've not seen one of these uh, issues in a number of years. Oh, this is the one I want to show here. This was from Saturday, April 16th, 1954, and this one, I'm sure many of you remember Hurricane Hazel came through. And there were several pictures here of the damage and uh, articles talking about uh, the extent of the damage in the Rocky Mountain and the surrounding area uh, from Hurricane Hazel. But like I said, just about every other page is a headline, I mean, not a headline, but a front page. Um, here's another one from November 23rd, 1963. Oswald charged in Kennedy's murder. Um, somewhere, uh, my mother had kept the headline from, I guess, the day of the murder, uh, murder and, and I, if I remember correctly, I think it says Kennedy slain. I think that was the headline on that particular issue. But again, these are all, uh, front pages of the telegram from various years and this particular one was put out oh last one here the back page from may 12th uh no 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 1932 okay i misread it may 12th 1932 Lindbergh baby dead and so I, I just, it was just neat to me to go through and look at these as i said they were front pages from the various years that the Telegram had printed and they reprinted them for this special edition paper. This particular one came out in 1988, as I said. And so if anyone's got any more of these, I'd, I'd be glad to share them with the show. I'd love to see some more of them, frankly. I, I remember seeing these in the past, but I have not seen one in, in some time. And uh, thanks go out to Mr. William Rackley and his aunt for allowing me to borrow those. And um, I'll certainly give them back to her. And thanks again for that. Um, before we get into the pictures too, I just want to say again, you know, how much I appreciate those that that contribute to this show each week. I mean, I have, I hear from several of you uh, throughout the course of the week in between shows each week, and you share your knowledge with me and your wisdom. Some of you are a little bit shy about calling in or getting on the show, and I understand that this isn't a format for everybody, but I do sincerely appreciate the phone calls and um, the visits, um, and any time, if you ride by my office and see my truck there, feel free to stop. I encourage you, in fact, to do so. Uh, I've got some old pictures and things around my office you might find of interest. Uh, I've got a ton of pictures, uh, and that list is growing daily. I'm, I'm adding new pictures to my collection uh, literally every day. And so um, with folks bringing by pictures and folks sending me pictures by email and, and me getting on the Internet and, and finding some myself, uh, I'm getting quite a collection. And so anyway, those of you that uh, watch the show each week and, and participate, uh, I thank you. And, and uh, you've heard me say it before, this show wouldn't be what it is without your contribution. And so I sincerely appreciate that. Okay, that being said, this week when I was getting ready for tonight's show, uh, doing some digging and some research, I wanted to revisit a couple of old pictures and old, uh, briefly anyway, old topics from previous shows. But I ran across some pictures that, frankly, I had never seen before uh, and, and a couple of archives I found on the internet. So the first one, this first picture uh, is, is a fairly large picture of the entire Planters Oil Mill complex over on Cokie Road. So Lee, if you'll put that up for us. Um, we have in the past 
talked about the planters over this is one of course that burned in 1983 uh, some massive fire over there I many of you have called in and said you remember um, the extensive damage that was done to that entire complex there um, the number of fire departments that responded it was obviously a catastrophic fire um, I, I think it's safe to say one of the worst this area has ever known and and I was gone I was out of the country when this took place I do not I can't say I remember that fire because I was not in the country when this took place but anyway, I, today I went online and I looked just to see how much I could, I could bring back in a modern day picture and literally the only thing that I could find, of course that's an empty field there now, and it's even been classified as a, uh, I think the proper term is brown dirt, basically in a contaminated area. And so in order for anything else to be built there or for that property to be built or used for anything else, it's, it's got to undergo quite a bit of testing and so forth. But in the in bottom of your screen, those two elongated buildings, I'm not sure what they were, but of the two, the first one, to the right anyway, is still there. The second one, I guess, has been torn down over the years, but I actually saw a picture online today. And you know, if you go to Google and type in an address, um, you can get an aerial map, you can go to street map, and of course you can get just a regular street map. But um, the aerial map as well as the street level map showed one of those two buildings is still in existence and I just thought that was neat to look at uh, how much that whole area has changed and this is, is a really good uh, visual indicator of just how massive and just how big that planters operation was when it was in full operation now I don't know when this picture was taken there was no context uh, or no uh, caption it just said planters oil mill but I immediately recognized the area and recognized the mill from prior uh, pictures that I had seen and as I said this is one I had not seen before so I wanted to share that with you okay Lee um, this the next couple pictures you remember from last week's show we talked about a hotel and this was a picture Mr. Wallace Abernathy had sent me of the Woodard Hotel and we had a little bit of discussion about this and we you know None of us remember it. Obviously, it was, I think it, I don't know if it burned down or was torn down sometime in the 1905, 1910 range, somewhere along in there. But um, this picture was one of the ones that Mr. Abernathy sent me. And then I actually, if you put that next picture up, this next picture is one that Eric Dawson brought me. And it's a, I'm not sure, this came from um, Edgecombe County Memorial Library, and I'm not sure how they acquired it. Um, but it's obviously a wintertime shot. You can see snow on the roof and snow on the ground. And uh, it looks like snow on that tree there in front of the hotel. And so we also have a map that shows where this hotel was. And when Eric came by the office yesterday, he and I were looking at the map. And this is entirely my fault, Eric. I apologize. I had the map upside down. We were looking at the map upside down. And I didn't realize that until today. I talked to um, Mr. Abernathy and got the, the straight scoop on how to view the map and so I intentionally turned it around in my computer so Lee the next picture if you would is the map of the location of the Woodard Hotel and obviously East Railroad Street is now Main Street that's Thomas Street there so we're on the east side of the railroad tracks and the Woodard Hotel is was sitting in the same location location where currently the Douglas Block is the Douglas Building. So obviously this was uh, preceded the Douglas Building, but right there on that corner where the Douglas Building is was where the uh, Woodard Hotel was. And obviously things have changed quite a bit now, but in any case that's where it was. Uh, and when we looked at the map originally, we thought because everything was kind of backwards it said East Thomas Street there and East Railroad Street and looking at the map it all looked like all that was on the west side of Main Street and then I realized that I, that I had the map upside down so anyway that's where it was and sometime during the business operation uh, during the time the business was in operation the hotel was in operation they had I guess some business cards printed up in this next picture Lee if you would put that up for us is a picture of a business card and if you, one thing interesting about this is that they actually misspelled the name of the hotel. Instead of Woodard, they put a W in there and called it Woodward. But uh, from the 1908 city directory, we were able to determine that Mrs. Uh, W.R. Winstead uh, was the proprietor and, and the, it, it was indeed the, the Woodard Hotel and not the Woodward Hotel. Um, the omnibus, uh, this was something I thought was interesting. 
uh, was kind of like a, a shuttle, if you will, that ran from the train to the hotel and back and forth so that passengers getting off the train wouldn't have to walk to the hotel or people who were checking out a hotel wouldn't have to walk back to the train. So that omnibus was like a present day shuttle that would carry guests to and from the Woodard Hotel uh, to the train station. And back in those days, of course, other than stagecoach, uh, the train was the primary means of travel, uh, particularly out of this area. Now, people in the media area, you know, there were a few that had cars, obviously, a few that had horse and buggies. Um, quite a few, I'm sure, just had a horse uh, still. But uh, at least for those who traveled in and out of the immediate area, uh, train was primary travel, and the omnibus was the way they got to and from the, the train station to the Willard Hotel. So, okay, uh, let's see, Lee, let's, let's, before we take our first break, let's take a look at these next two in fairly quick succession. Um, we've had the Shady Lake, Moses Shady Lake Motel pictures on the show several times in the past. And um, this is one, again, I had never seen this picture here. I'm not sure, I think that might be the proprietor, Mr. Mosley, there in this picture. Um, I don't recall ever knowing him. I, I knew some of his relatives, some of his family, but I think that might be him there. And that's probably 301 to your right, the bottom hand of the picture there. And all my life I knew that place as the Mosley Shady Lake Motel, but for the life of me I could never remember seeing the lake. I, maybe it was there when I was a small child, I just don't remember it. But in all the pictures, particularly the older ones I'd seen, in postcards and so forth, there was, of course, a lake beside the Mosley Shady Lake Motel. And so, Lee, if you'll bring the next picture up, this is the only picture that, um, that I have not seen before of a picture of the lake. And you, you can see there's two people in a little boat there. And uh, so this was the actual lake. It was identified in the picture as the lake at the Shady Lake Motel. So there you go. And that, uh, I'm not sure, I don't think I recall seeing a date, but I'm guessing this was probably the early 1950s. Um, I'm not sure, maybe someone knows when the Shady Lake Motel was in existence. I know when I was a child it was still in operation through the 60s and 70s, but I don't recall exactly when it opened up. So, but just looking by the clothes that people are wearing, I'm, I'm guessing uh, early 1950s, possibly late 40s, but it was certainly a very popular motel, and I, I was reading today, in fact, on the website, that it was one of the more popular tourist stops along the way. Um, and the, the, one of the things that made it so popular, besides the lake and the, and the proximity between New York and Miami, halfway, obviously, was the what was later referred to as a Uniroyal Gal. And Lee, if you'll put the next picture up, this was a, a, a fairly recent picture. Uh, those of you who frequent the MNO every year uh, out there at the Wooten Farm will recognize this. Uh, she's had a bit of a, a makeover or, or wardrobe redo since she stood out there in front of Mosley Shady, uh, Shady Lake Motel. But this is the Uniroyal gal that used to stand out there by the Shady Lake Motel on 301. I think back then she was wearing a red bikini, if I remember. Uh, I want to say her hair might have even been a different color. But anyway, that's her. Um, this picture was taken, uh, I don't know, a few years ago perhaps, but that's where she is now, and uh, she's a proud addition to the MNO uh, event every year out there at the Wooten Farm. So, okay, Lee, bring it back to me. Um, when we come back, uh, I mentioned earlier that I had been scrounging up some pictures, and I ran across an, an archive um, that just had boo coodle bunches of pictures of Rocky Mountain Mills that frankly I had never seen before. And so when we come back, we're going to show you some pictures from the mill uh, that I dare say you've probably never seen these pictures before. So we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll jump back into pictures and I'll show you some pictures of Rocky Mountain Mills from many, many years ago. Don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday. Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory 
as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service. We offer refreshments prior to visitations and services of our family. And we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. I'm John Check, resident of Rocky Mount, District 25. We're all waiting to hear from our current North Carolina House representative condemning the actions of Andre Knight and other corruption occurring at City Hall. Why have you not condemned Andre Knight's deliberate and self-serving abuse of power? How many people in our city have had their utilities turned off while Mr. Knight avoided paying $47,704 in utilities? How many people must go without while our city manager, Small Tony, feasts on expensive dinners at the expense of our tax dollars? Why won't you speak up for those who are struggling in our city? Are you seeking to protect Andre Knight and gain his endorsement once again? I'm calling on you, James Gallier, to demand your friend Andre Knight pay back his debt to our wonderful city and resign. I care about our fellow residents, and I want what is best for all. We need to end this corruption so that our people may thrive once again. My name is John Check, and I approve this ad. Paid for by the committee to elect John Check, Brad Bobbitt, Treasurer. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. We're in our 18th year of practice at the Hammer Chiropractic Center, and we've seen over 15,000 different people in the Rocky Mount area. 40% of headaches actually come from a neck problem. Many patients come in taking multiple aspirin, over-the-counter medications and such a day, and we can get you to stop doing that and actually fix the problem so the headaches don't arise anymore. A lot of people think chiropractic hurts. It does not. Most of the people come in and they feel great when they leave. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. And we're back, we're back. Folks, for just tuning in, you're watching Way Back Wednesday. I'm your host, Randy Adcox. Good of you to join us. Uh, before the break, we were looking at some old pictures of uh, old Planters Oil Mill, the Woodard Hotel, uh, the Mosley Shady Lake Motel. And as I mentioned before the break, we actually, we've covered Rocky Mountain Mills every way that's covered on this show. And, and it's always a, a topic close to my heart. Uh, my grandfather, my grandmother, my father, I had a, a aunts and uncles worked at Rocky Mountain Mills. Um, so, I, you know, it's just a, I have a very close connection to that meal and the employees, the prior former employees of that meal, and certainly the area around the meal, the meal village as it's known, the meal hill. And so when I ran across this archive collection of pictures from the meal, um, I thought, well, I've already seen all these, but I'll look at them anyway. Well, lo and behold, I went through, and there must be 100 pictures in this archive. It's two different sets on a couple of different websites, and I had not seen any of them. I'd seen some similar to these, and so it's a, it's a montage, if you will. It's a collection of pictures of the meal, pictures of employees, pictures of meal events, and I just thought it was interesting enough to, even though we've covered the meal many times in the past, um, I just thought it was a neat thing to do to share these again. And you may see somebody you know. You may see yourself if you had any anything to do with the meal over the, the years that it was in operation. So without further ado, um, Lee, the first picture is actually one of the pictures from this website, and I thought it was really an interesting picture because, uh, and Gene, I hope you're watching, a few weeks ago, Gene Pridgen called me and he said, have you heard anything about a boat ride on the Tar River you could take? They charged like 10 cent, and you got in at Sunset Park, it took, took you down the river, down toward the mill, and then brought you back up and went up a little ways up under the bridge, and then turned around and came back and brought you back to the boat landing there at Sunset Park. And I said, no, I've never heard of that. He said, well, I remember it as a child, and Gene is in his 70s now, so I've heard other folks that they remember it too. But I have scoured the web trying to find a picture, anything to do with a boat that was available for, for rides on Tar River, and I think this is it. 
Um, it doesn't identify itself that way, but this is certainly the Rocky Mountain Mills. The dam is behind. You can see. I don't know if you can zoom in or not, Lee, but um, this is actually they they've got this boat right there at the dam. Obviously, the water level is low enough that it's not flowing over the dam, but they are dangerously close to the the dam itself, the wall of the dam. And I just thought this was, this has got to be what he was talking about because I remember him saying the boat would take you all the way down to the to the mill and then bring you back up again. So I'm not positive, but I think this is the boat he was talking about. Uh, there was a driver in the back of the boat uh, working the motor and, and driving the boat. And these three young ladies uh, were identified. Oh, we got a call. Let's see who this is. Hello there. Are you on the air? Hello. Hey, Eric. How you doing, buddy? All right. That uh, that boat when it was out there on the river where you could buy and pay a fare to ride in was put out there probably in the late fifties by the Exchange Club. I don't remember what the name of it was, but they had a little shelter down there somewhere across down the river there where Sunset Park was, where they kept that boat under a shelter. And I don't know how long it was there, but it was something that was an enterprise that put was put there for a few years by the Exchange Club. And they just didn't ever sell enough tickets to keep it up, and it, it didn't stay there but just for a couple of years. Now, what was the Exchange Club? I don't really know, but I was talking to Tracy down at the library not too long ago about that trying, and she looked it up, and the name of the boat was something like the Interchange O or something of them. Oh. Uh, it slips my mind right now, even though it ain't been but just uh, five, six, seven, eight days that <laughs> she looked it up. Well, and this may not be that boat. I'm not sure. Uh, like I said, it looks like there's a guy in the back driving it. Well, there is a guy in the back driving a boat for sure. Uh, these, right. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Yeah, these three women were actually identified. Some of you may know. Well, this is Barbara Coley Key, uh, Cleo O'Connell, and Pauline somebody. I guess it's left to right, Barbara, Cleo, and Pauline. In fact, in the bottom right-hand corner of the picture, it, they're identified as Babs. Um, I guess that says Cleo in her last name, and then uh, Pauline. I'm not sure. It's hard to read that, but on the, the picture was captioned as Barbara Coley Key, Cleo O'Connell, and Pauline Unknown. Um, but anyway, it was identified as boat behind Rocky Mountain Mills also. So I just thought that was neat, and I, I had not seen this picture before, and it was in this collection of Rocky Mountain Mill pictures. So anyway, okay, Lee, let's go to the next picture then. And again, all of these in this segment here, this was actually a, obviously a cotton field, and it was in this collection too. And, you know, uh, cotton is what uh, put the mill there. Cotton is what... Uh, in, in many ways helped get Rocky Mountain off the ground. Uh, it, you know, it's been no secret that slaves uh, picked the cotton, helped build the mill, uh, and were in many ways responsible for that mill getting off the ground and getting going. So um, it look, I'm not positive it's a black and white picture and it's hard to tell for certain, but I'm guessing these were, they, it could have been a mixture of white and black, but in any case, uh, it looks to me like they're probably all uh, cotton pickers um, from, uh, this picture could be from the early 1800s up into the early 1900s. It's hard to say for sure. The mill was in operation from 1818 all the way up to, uh, to the, uh, 19, what, 92 or 93, I think it was. But anyway, this this picture I thought was kind of uh, a neat part of the history of Rocky Mount Mill because obviously it was a cotton mill and, and here's uh, a scene from, from a cotton picking operation. Um, okay, let's go to the next picture then. I just thought this was neat here. Uh, many of you may remember this gentleman here. This is Mr. Kermit Paris. Uh, Kermit was actually kin to me. Um, he and my mother, I believe, were first cousins. And um, so anyway, uh, he worked at Rocky Mountain Mills for 52 years, and he was a bit of a celebrity. And in fact, up at the top of this, this was probably from the Rocky Mount Telegram in 1990, I think it was, January 13th, it was like 1991 maybe. Uh, but anyway, several folks uh, actually autographed this thing for Kermit. And some of these folks I recognize, some are now passed away, but I do recognize some of these names on here. But I, I thought it was neat, uh, it says the Kermit Paris Fan Club. But Kermit was a character, um, he was an avid fisherman, drove around old green Dodge truck for years and years uh, with the words Chub Chaser, I believe it was on the side just below the door, uh, a window on his driver's door. But anyway, this tells a little bit, uh, he you know, talks about his time at the mill and 
um, how he came to get a job at the mill. And um, he said when he started, uh, he was making 44 cents an hour in 1943. And said when World War II came, and um, he, he got back from World War II, of course, he went to war and came back. And then in 1947, he was making $1.12 an hour on third shift. Uh, his wife, Doris, worked there. And um, she made $1.02 an hour. And apparently one of the jobs there, maybe someone who worked there or used to work there, can tell me what the word DOFF, D-O-F-F, -F, is. But uh, he says, um, let's see, Darcy's wife who spun and doffed on third made a dollar two. He said, I doffed, D-O-F-F-E-D, -F -F -E he said, I doffed for 29 years. The rest of the time I fixed, overhauled, and built bobbins for the mill. Uh, Paris knows the history of the mill, how in 1863 it was burned by federal troops from New Bern. Um, the owner of the mill at that time was a mason, as was the commander of the federal troops, and that bomb was enough to save the big office. And I've heard that story before, too. Uh, Kermit was, like I said, quite a character. Uh, I didn't realize he worked for the mill 52 years. He had quite a span there, obviously. But uh, anyway, this was a, a neat article that appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram in January of 1990. They cut off the end of the year here, but I believe it's 1991 that the article came out. So, okay, Lee, let's go to the next picture then. And this next one is actually, I don't know if anybody knows this lady. This picture just caught my eye. This is obviously taken on the rocks down below the dam at Rocky Mountain Mill in the background back there. And she's identified as Mabel Coley Sykes. Um, and it says from 1940s. So again, all of these pictures we're looking at here um, were in a collection of pictures dealing with meal life, uh, the operation of the meal. There was a ton of pictures of different machines and different equipment and different operating aspects of the meal. Uh, as I said, some I had seen similar pictures in the past and I didn't get an awful lot of those, but there must be well over 100 pictures in these couple of different archives and the vast majority of which I had never seen before. So anyway, this is Miss Mabel Coley Sykes um, and this was in the 40s. I don't know exactly which year. It just says 1940s on the, the caption of the picture. So, okay. This next picture really kind of made me smile. Um, and this was in the exact same collection, same time frame. Um, this lady here was identified as Mary Louise Langston. And I don't know if she was related to um, uh, Langston, Rudolph Langston. Um, they used to work at Adams and Robson's hot dog stand down there. Um, but I just, she was dressed obviously uh, very, very nicely. Her and a gentleman both for that matter. And I, I thought it somewhat ironic that they would be <laughs> dressed this nice to work in that meal. Let's get this call here. Hello there, you on the air. You ready to go? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, you just used the term doffer. Okay. A doffer who worked in a textile mill was somebody who would take uh, bolts of cloth off of a loom. They were there to take and remove something from that had been done in the process and, and also thread that was being put on a spindle. Once it got filled up, it needed to be removed and replaced. That's what the term DAFA meant. Okay. Well, I appreciate I had no idea, honestly. I, I didn't. I never remember hearing that phrase before. Um, all right. But thanks again. I appreciate it. All right. There you go. See, that's what this show is all about, folks. You watch this show every week. I guarantee you'll learn something every week. But this pretty lady right here, I, something about her, she reminds me of a movie star. I, I just love her hairdo. I love her dress. She's got on a nice gold watch, it looks like. Could be silver. We'll say it's gold. Um, but she is just, just dressed to the nines um, to go work in the mill. And that just struck me as odd. But at the same time, it's just a... It's it's a you know indication of a bygone era. You would never. I'm in and out of mills on a fairly regular basis. I do some computer work for a couple of different types of operations that are similar, not textile mills, but certainly mills. And uh, over the years, they developed a very casual approach to uh, the work dress code. And so, uh, even the ladies in the office the <laughs> don't dress up like this to come to work now. I promise you. But uh, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know if she's. Related to anybody that's viewing tonight, but uh, her name was Mary Louise Langston, and she's obviously working with threads there. So I just I thought it was a neat picture. All right, Lee, let's go to the next picture then, and 
This one also made me smile because this uh, this picture right here, um, the lady to the left there in, in the dark top is actually Doris Paris. Uh, she was the wife of Kermit we showed a few minutes ago. And this picture, uh, these employees were honored on December 21st, 1990 for 35, 40, and 45 years of service with the company. Thomas B. Battle in the center, he's a gentleman with white hair. Um, he was the president of Rocky Mountain Mills at that time. He presents awards to left to right, James L. Price for 45 years of service, Doris Paris for 40 years of service, Arthur Watkins for 35 years of service. Um, by the way, Arthur Watkins, I used to work, when I was in high school, I worked down there at the J Mart on Pine Street for Mr. Joe Allen. And Mr. Watkins used to come in there, and he was a cat for sure. Um, he would dance. Um, <laughs> I mean, just a happy fella. Just every time I ever saw him, he was smiling, happy. He would come into in the store there to get a, a Pepsi Cola, pack and out of something, and he would dance around the store. <laughs> just a lot of fun to watch. Anyway, 35 years of service. And this was in 19, oh gee, what did I say a while ago? 1990, okay? Uh, on the other side of Mr. Uh, Battle was Pauline Joyner. Um, she was being presented with a 35 year award. And then William Price, 40 years. And on the far right, Mr. Al Alton Williams, 45 years of service. So obviously back then, you know, meal work over the years has, has almost had a, I don't know, a negative connotation about it, uh, like it was some something less than honorable work. But I'm going to tell you, that that's just not true. These were hardworking people. Um, they worked. They, they didn't make an awful lot of money, but it was steady money. And a lot of these folks, you know, to work 35, 40, 45 years for one place is almost unheard of now. These folks, obviously, they must have enjoyed the work. They must have enjoyed their job. Uh, I'm sure there was some camaraderie involved in, in the longevity that some of these folks worked at these mills. But in any case, um, that's just something that's rare today to see someone spend that much time with one company. And yet, over the history of Rocky Mountain Mills, it was, it was not at all uncommon for someone to work 30, 40 years. Uh, my grandfather worked 41 years for him. So. Okay, Lee, the next picture then is actually, let's see, this was a, an award presented, um, and this was in 1991. That's Mayor Fred Turner on the left-hand side of your screen there. Uh, it's Mel Bobbitt on the right-hand side of your screen. And the gentleman in the center is Mr. Joseph A. Pope, who in 1991 was the city's oldest worker. Um, and he was presented with this award, and he was 80 years old. Um, and I'm not quite sure, well, I guess the fact that uh, he worked for the city uh, and the mayor was preside, uh, bestowing upon him, bestowing upon this honor, uh, I'm not quite sure how this was in, in, involved with the mill operation, but it was in this, in this photo collection of pictures from the mill. But at 80 years old, he was still working. And again, these are numbers you just don't hear about anymore. You never see anybody working those kind of numbers. I'll tell you what, Lee, bring it back to me. Uh, we've got a bunch more pictures to show folks, and when we come back from the break, we'll show you some more pictures of Rocky Mountain Mills and the operation and some other pictures that I guarantee you've not seen before. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in a few minutes with more Way Back Wednesday. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitations and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. I'm John Check, resident of Rocky Mountain District 25. 
We're all waiting to hear from our current North Carolina House representative condemning the actions of Andre Knight and other corruption occurring at City Hall. Why have you not condemned Andre Knight's deliberate and self-serving abuse of power? How many people in our city have had their utilities turned off while Mr. Knight avoided paying $47,704 in utilities? How many people must go without while our city manager, Small Tony, feasts on expensive dinners at the expense of our tax dollars? Why won't you speak up for those who are struggling in our city? Are you seeking to protect Andre Knight and gain his endorsement once again? I'm calling on you, James Gallier, to demand your friend, Andre Knight, pay back his debt to our wonderful city and resign. I care about our fellow residents, and I want what is best for all. We need to end this corruption so that our people may thrive once again. My name is John Check, and I approve this ad. Paid for by the committee to elect John Check, Brad Bobbitt, Treasurer. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. We're in our 18th year of practice at the Hammer Chiropractic Center, and we've seen over 15,000 different people in the Rocky Mount area. 40% of headaches actually come from a neck problem. Many patients come in taking multiple aspirin, over-the-counter medications and such a day, and we can get you to stop doing that and actually fix the problem so the headaches don't rise anymore. A lot of people think chiropractic hurts. It does not. Most of the people come in and they feel great when they leave. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. And we're back, and we're back. You know, during the break, I went back, and Lee, if you would, put that last picture back up, the one we just showed with the gentleman that um, was an 80-year-old employee. Um, I don't know how I misread this, but that's exactly what I did because Mr. Joseph A. Pope, center of Rocky Mount Mills, was a Rocky Mount Mill employee, and that's why he was being honored. Let me get this call here. Hold this one second. Hello, Larry, you're on the air. Hello, Harold. Yes, sir, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing great. Hope you are. Ran a couple of your photos uh, got my attention. That planter's cotton oil fertilizer. Yes, sir. Uh, that you had, and you said the two buildings that seem. Uh, a little bit offset from the from the fertilizer plant or the company there. Right. Those two buildings really uh, were like on the railroad property, or they were across the railroad tracks. You're right. You're exactly I don't right. Think they were part of. They were part. Of, they were little commercial buildings that were built there in the '60s, I guess. Yeah, I, and I knew I should have been more clear. I knew they weren't part of the of the mill operation, but I was when I went on. Uh, did a Google search to see what was in the area today that was that was visible from that picture. That was the only thing I found was that those little buildings there, and only one of the two was still remaining. But but you're right. I don't think it had anything to do with the Planters Oil Mill. And I think Cypress Street butts into the railroad track along there where those buildings are built. Mm -hmm. uh, the photo that got my attention, uh, of course, was the Woodard Hotel or the hotel shot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the business card that you showed? Right. It had a name on it, Mrs. W.R. Winstead. Right. That would have been my mother's name, but she was never involved with the, the hotel business, I don't believe. How about that? In the 40s, we were picking cotton in Edgecombe County. <laughs> but, but my dad ran a very successful country store on 58 Highway south of Nashville. Yeah. Uh, for many years, but uh, in the 40s, we were we were farming at Temperance Hall, and my daddy was running the store down there. Mm-hmm. Well, that you know, I thought about you when I saw that, but I said, well, I don't know if it's any relation or not. It could be down the road, down to some way down the line, could be Ken. You reckon? In that era in Rocky Mount, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure. I guess uh, because of the Winstead Plantation down on Winstead Road or Winstead Avenue. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure somewhere along the way you have seen some of the photos of, of that era 
when Winstead Avenue was a driveway to the plantation uh, back across the railroad where the fire station is now. I'm there where Charles Johnson's farm was. That's old Charles Johnson farm, yeah. that's correct. Mm -hmm. That that was a Winstead plantation, I believe, in, in the oh, early years of my life, anyway. Right. I, I seem to recall, I'd forgotten that, honestly, I really had, but I seem to recall hearing about that. Now, I, and it was, my dad was known as W.R. Winstead, but we were never involved in the hotel business. Right. And you know, I, now that you say that, I believe that, do you know if your dad ever bought anything from Davis & Company Auto Parts? Does that ring a bell? For many years. Yeah. See, I worked there and I used, I worked back in the back and we, part of my job when I first went to work there was loading up trucks that would go around all the little country stores and deliver old Jeep, things like uh, radiator hoses and fan belts right. and battery terminals and motor oil and they, transmission uh, fluid. Rural stores like my daddy. Yeah. I handled many uh, automotive parts right. to keep the old cars going, I guess, in those days. And farm equipment, too. We sold farm tractor, oil field, a lot of... Yep. They did buy from Davidson Company for many years. I was president of J.C.'s the year that uh, Grady Davis sort of came, got out of school, I guess, and came to Rocky Mount to work in his daddy's business. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, did, uh, we did buy a lot of... My dad bought a lot of stuff from the Davidson Company. Hey, Grady Davis was a fine man, one of the best men I ever worked for in my life. Yeah, he sure uh, was. We had some similar summertime occupations. Uh, I worked at Barber's Auto Supply. Mm-hmm. They're on Franklin Street. Yeah. Which is an old dilapidated building now, but it was a very viable building back in the 50s. And when I was 16 and 17, I worked there with the Barber's Auto Supply, delivering various um, automotive supplies to stores throughout eastern North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of young guys did that. I, we had some guys work today just coming when I worked there. Right. And, uh, and they, they, I thank uh, you and Eric for the research and the time that you guys have put in to do this job. And, you do a good job. Well, thank you. It's a labor of love for me. I know. I think I speak for Eric too. Uh, he and I both are old, old souls at heart. Uh, he certainly got more knowledge and wisdom and, and experience than I do. But um, I, I love it. I love this this topic, and I love doing this show. So thank you so much for watching. Well, Eric has a, a good background and a, and a good memory, of course. He does. Those days, and you guys make a good team. Well, thank you, thank you. Appreciate. It. Take a bow, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. All right, buddy. We'll see you. Okay. All right, Lee, I'll tell you what, Dan. Let's go ahead. These next couple of pictures really threw me because I, of all the pictures I've seen, Demio, I had never seen anything like these next two, three pictures. So, Lee, let's go through the next one up here. And um, this is actually, this was identified uh, in this collection of pictures from Rocky Mount Mills, and it was identified as Dime Store. Now, I knew Rocky Mount Mills had a canteen. And that may be what this is. This may be a picture of the canteen, but I never heard it referred to as a dime store. But it was in this collection, and all the pictures in this collection were supposedly of Rocky Mountain Mills, the Mill Hill, the Mill Village, and that area. But I'd never seen a picture inside the canteen, and I had never seen a picture that was identified as the dime store. So anyway, that's how this picture was identified. And I'm just guessing this is probably 1940s, perhaps early 1950s. But um, great picture, and on my computer I could zoom right in and read a lot of labels of the snacks and candy bars up there. Um, it's just a, a neat old picture uh, of a time that I certainly didn't know anything about. The next picture, Lee, if you would, was just identified as diner. Now, I, again, never knew, never heard about anything uh, in the meal known as a diner. Um, it looks obviously it's an old wooden building. Uh, it's got the seats there at the bar on the left hand side, little booths on the right hand side. But I never er, ever heard of a diner being in the meal. Again, I heard about the canteen. But if anyone remembers this or knows anything about any kind of uh, dime store, number one, or a diner, number two, on the meal property, let me know because this is this was all news to me. I didn't remember seeing anything about it anywhere else in any other pictures. And this next picture, I'm not quite sure why this was included in there unless this young lady was a, uh, an employee of the mill, 
but she's at a record player there and to her left in that little wall cabinet there is three shelves from left to right slam packed full of albums I mean and these are old I'm sure the old 33 LPs and then of course there on the table beside the record player is another stack of old albums and this was identified as record player so I don't know if that, this was a job that someone had in the mill to play music to um, cheer up the workers I don't know I, it, it just it was a neat picture uh, and it zooms in good it's a good high resolution picture I, I'm not certain I would guess either Bugs Berenger or Charlie Killebrew may have taken these pictures uh, they weren't identified as such but it's entirely possible just from the detail and the quality and the clarity of the pictures it's entirely possible that Charlie or Bugs Berenger either one let's get this call here hello there you're on the air that lady sitting there looking at playing those records and whatever as old as that picture looks like it is. That's probably uh, 78 RPM records that would pre predate the vinyl records from uh, later on. It very well may be, Eric. I hadn't thought about that. That's a good possibility. The 45 RPM records that were introduced to the American public, like was on the jukeboxes, came into existence in June of 1949. And I don't know, I don't really have a date and an understanding on when the vinyl, 33 RPM vinyl records were. But when I was a little bitty boy, the records that were on jukeboxes were 78 RPM that were very breakable. Mm -hmm. And anywhere there was a restaurant that had a jukebox, they had 78 RPM records on it around 19... 49 or 50, but uh, that's kind of the time frame uh, about the transition from the fast speed records to the 33s. Okay. All right. Appreciate it, buddy. Have a good one. Okay. All right, Lee, I'll tell you what, these are next. There's one, two, three, four pictures in sequence here, and we'll kind of blow through these fairly quickly, but these are from uh, parades, um, and again, it was. This is obviously down there by uh, Easley's uh, warehouse, uh, down there near the intersection of Falls Road and Main Street, I believe is where this was at. Um, but this was dated 1936, and um, it just says Rocky Mountain Mills. And I'm not sure whether this was uh, a Christmas parade. It almost looks Christmassy, then again, not quite. But uh, it was just identified as uh, Rocky Mountain Mills 1936 parade float. And the next picture, Lee, was actually from the very next year, 1937. And again, I'm not sure where this picture was taken. Uh, let's get this copy. Maybe someone recognize it. Hello there. You on the air? All right. That building you just showed the front door of was the Easy Tobacco Warehouse. That place burned in April of 1968. It was right there next door to the Thornton Ricks Tobacco Factory, the original factory. And it backed up to the Atlantic Coastline Mainline Railroad tracks. Round on the back side was the Cobb and Fox Hall uh, tobacco warehouse that was back in there behind Daniel's Cash Grocery. Mm -hmm. That big fire was so big you could see it in the aisle from uh, as far away as Spring Hope. I was in Spring Hope that day when that stuff burned up. Wow. And it was a very noticeable event in the aisle. Wow. That's, that's a fire. That it was a, a fire. big fire. Yes, it was. Good gracious. All right. All right, buddy. Thanks again. Okay. All right, Lee. So let's see. This was 1937. The next picture is from 1938. And I looked at these, and obviously they're they're very well done floats. I mean, Lee, can you zoom in on that? I can't remember. I can't see what that. I can't read that. Um, I'm not sure. There you go. Over a century of progress. So, gee, I mean, that Rocky Mountain Mills was established in 1818, so this could have actually been from the 1920s even. Um, but no, it was identified in the, in the picture as 1938, so um, I guess that's obviously more than a century, but in any case, uh, and I, I still don't know what the occasion was. This doesn't look to me like a Christmas parade. I see leaves on a tree that was obviously not dead of winter, so... Uh, maybe it was some kind of uh, Labor Day parade or um, I know it was a couple of different parades that happened throughout the year so maybe it was one of those 
All right, let's go to the next one then. We're about to run out of time here. Um, this next one was from 1947, you can see there. And again, I can't tell from the float itself what the celebration is about, but um, these were are all part of that same, same collection um, of, from Rocky Mountain Mills. All right, let's go to the next one then. We, I, we'll never get through all of these. I've got another probably 15 pictures here that are part of this collection. We'll save these for next week. This was a neat picture here to me. This is 1989. They had a celebration of, golly, and I want to say it was like a million hours, uh, accident-free. Uh, it was combined employee work hours, and the meal fed the workers. And um, I would venture to say there was probably some Bob Melton's barbecue, coleslaw, boiled potatoes, Brunswick stew. Uh, it doesn't say that in the picture caption, but just judging by the pots, it looks like it could have maybe some fried chicken too. Uh, I know that was commonplace for Bob Melton's to cater these kinds of events, so I'm not sure that's what uh, this was, but I would I'd be willing to bet money it was probably Bob Melton's catering. It was some good food, I'm sure. Lee, let's take, take one more and we'll call it a night. This last one um, is something that I'm sure some of you remember, some of you. Um, my age and older will certainly remember when report cards looked like this uh, when they still gave out A's and B's and this was a pretty sharp student here Miss Barbara Coley in 1947 uh, got all A's and B's no C's no D's and certainly no E's and she got pretty good attendance too I think she missed one day maybe two down at the bottom but I remember when report cards like this and I used to get mine like this too so this is certainly from a bygone era I'm not sure when they stopped this, but this is the way mine were all the way through school. So, Lee, bring it back to me. Folks, that's going to do it for us tonight. I do apologize. We, we ran and slammed out of time. I've got many more that I want to share with you. We'll save these for next week. Um, there's a, probably another dozen, maybe 15 additional pictures of the Rocky Mount Mills collection. And so between now and then, I'll do some more digging and see what I can find out. But I um, want to thank you again for tuning in tonight. Appreciate all the phone calls and, and all the kind words. We appreciate you more than you know. Folks, have yourselves a great week. Take care of yourselves and be kind to each other. We'll see you next week with more Way Back Wednesday. Good night. Wednesday. Sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work.